Hi friends, welcome to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. And you join us together today as we continue to work through the Gospel of Luke. And today we're going to be looking at a very famous passage of scripture, certainly in some areas of the church. And we're going to use this passage to ask the question, what has God done? The passage we're going to be reading today is Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 56. You'll find a link there, or you'll actually find the, the text of the scriptures in the episode notes page, but and also a link to where you can access them, or you can just follow along as I read them, as I'll work through expositionally the entire chapter. So welcome, welcome again to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. And do hang on at the end, where I'll tell you lots of ways you can connect to this ministry and receive additional free Bible teaching resources. So, here we go. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is one of the most well-known and most admired women who have ever lived. Both Christianity and Islam, in fact, recognize her as the mother of this person called Jesus, making her, well, to put it mildly, a very well-known figure uh, virtually across the whole world. She is admired for how she handled her life, how she presented herself, the account of her in the biblical scriptures, and people from many traditions hold her in very high regard. However, we need to understand that she is also the subject of some controversy because she has been named and, in fact, dubbed the Mother of God. Now, this is because in the, of the fact that on December the 8th, 1854, Pope Pius the Ninth issued what was called a papal bull, <clears throat> which is ex essentially a sort of decree declaring the Immaculate Conception of Mary. This means that he declared her free from original sin, uh, free from sin from the very moment of her conception. And the document stated this, and I'm going to read it directly for you. We declare and pronounce and define that the most blessed Mary, the Virgin Mary, at the first instance of her conception, was preserved immaculate from all stain of original sin by the single grace and privilege of the omnipotent God, in virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Saviour of mankind. This doctrine was revealed by God and therefore must be believed firmly and consistently by all. So not surprisingly, this decree stirred quite a bit of controversy, as you can imagine. Some actually took it to mean that this was declaring that she was sinless in exactly the same way as Jesus. Others, of course, uh, a great many contested this belief very firmly. That whole debate was prominent throughout the 19th century. People don't really mention it much these days. In fact, up until 1950, it was a really hot potato. And in 1950, in November, another Pope, Pope Pius XII this time, made which, what was called an ex cathedra pronouncement, stating additionally that Mary's body was raised from the grave shortly after her death and her body and soul were reunited, and she was taken up and enthroned as what is called the Queen of Heaven. I'm sure you've heard that phrase about her. This pronouncement not only added to the existing controversy, uh, it actually uh, took it to a whole new level. And it's important to note that both these things are not actually based directly on any biblical test. Rather, it's revealed to this revelation to those who were in the church, church leadership at that time, and it was based upon the authority of the, the Catholic Church. So today, we got to realise that this is an important text and we need to fully understand it. And that's what I want us to do together. I want to explore it in a way where we're going to ask who Mary was, and also, interestingly, what I believe she herself would say about what is being said of her. Interestingly enough, we can find some real insights into her perspective, her perspective uh, by just reaching into the Gospel account of Luke. As we've discovered already in our previous uh, days together, we've seen already that Elizabeth, 
was also expecting a baby who would later be called well he she was told he would be named john but we discovered he will later be who we call john the baptist now while mary was expecting a baby at the same time it was revealed to her that he would be named jesus so when these two expectant mothers get together mary responds to the situation and her response which we're going to look at today i think gives us some real insight into how she might address this controversial issue you see in luke chapter one we find out well we thought it was yesterday actually we looked at this that when the angel told mary rejoice for you are highly favored he actually said the lord is with you and blessed are you among women not above women by the way among women now we have this situation and we saw where mary met elizabeth and elizabeth said uh, you know that that said that to her we now have in the next verses we're looking at today uh, Mary's response to that to the spontaneous greeting that was given to her by Elizabeth and Mary bursts forth in what is sometimes being called a song or even a hymn now this passage is known by many as the Magnificat due to its Latin translation of simply of the word blessed and this short hymn, song, poem is sprinkled throughout. Her response is sprinkled throughout, throughout with, uh, with allusions, references to the Old Testament's quotations, in fact. It contains only 11 verses, but one Bible scholar I read identified 15 direct discernible allusions to quotes from the Old Testament. And that, if nothing else, friends, uh, shows Mary's deep knowledge of scripture old testament scripture so what did mary say in her response to elizabeth well let's turn to luke chapter one and i'll read for you the whole thing beginning in verse 46 and mary said my soul glorifies the lord and my spirit rejoices in god my savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant from now on all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation he has performed mighty deeds with his arm he has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts he has brought down rulers and their thrones but he has lifted up the humble he has filled the hungry with good things but he has sent the rich away empty he has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised for our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. That's an additional sort of narrative verse at the end. OK, this spontaneous response of Mary, I think we can divide into three parts. First, she speaks about herself and what God has done for her. And then second, she shifts the focus to the people who will come later. And then finally, she actually talks about the whole nation of Israel itself and what this per what is, what's going is revealed to them through this. So it's a brief, but clearly it's a very dense and profound passage that reveals much about Mary's perspective. In the first part, we see Mary acknowledge God as her saviour, indicating the fact that she is not in fact sinless. And this, so this directly, immediately contradicts the notion of both her supposed immaculate conception and her uh, potentially her own sinless state. Additionally, there is no biblical evidence to support this idea of bodily assumption into heaven. Mary's hymn, in fact, Mary's song, in fact, just reveals that she is just a sinner in need of a saviour. We can see in verse 48, she says God regarded her in her lowly state and the fact that in future all generations shall call me blessed. So there are two important aspects contained in this verse. And they absolutely deserve our attention. Firstly, Mary acknowledges her humble and lowly social position. She comes from this little town, Nazareth, a small insignificant town, and it is Mary herself stating that she has been saved by God. Verse 48 emphasized the fact that it was God that saved her and blessed her. 
And this blessing is about her being transformed from a person of humble origins to her, what will be one of the most honored women in the history of humanity because she is obedient to and the will of God is seen to be fulfilled through her. The, that act itself is the blessing and it indicates also, I believe for us, how God can use the most unlikely and ordinary people for his divine purposes. Additionally, we see in verse 49, it contains the statement, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Now, this statement goes way beyond the blessing uh, because it, uh, an integral part of it, it suggests that God does, did in fact do great things for Mary, including this ultimate remarkable privilege of her being the mother of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So as I said, the first part of the passage focuses on Mary herself, emphasizing that God saved her, blessed her, and used her despite of these humbled beginnings. And this story, this song of Mary, this, this magnificent exclamation of Mary demonstrates that it was God that in fact chose her. She recognized that, she understood that, and that God also can choose the most unlikely individuals for his own divine purposes. Well, yes, even still today. <coughs> Now, in the preceding verses, 39 to 45, in chapter 1, which we looked at yesterday, if you were here with me, Elizabeth, remember, congratulated Mary, acknowledging her and saying she was blessed, but blessed because God used her to bring the Messiah into the world. And then here, in these opening verses, Mary is responding to this congratulations. Remember that. She responds by centering on and magnifying the Lord, not herself. She's showing the emphasis is not in any way on her own position or her own greatness, the opposite in, her, in fact. She's drawing attention to her lowly state and she highlights God's might, God's holiness, and as we shall see, even his mercy. The main point of the passage is clearly to me to reveal that Mary views herself as insignificant and chooses instead to focus on God's power, God's holiness, and God's mercy. The only action it says that she can take credit for is her belief, and even that she doesn't really refer to. Is it Elizabeth who mentions that in the, in verse, uh, in the preceding verse? So there, friends, to sum this up, Mary magnifies the Lord for saving her and blessing her and using her despite her very ordinary beginnings. She recognizes what's going on, but she recognizes ultimately that this is about what God has done for her. And what he did for her, he can do for anyone else who focuses on and reveres him. Mary goes way beyond herself in this passage, shifting her focus to other people, the very opposite of what lies at the heart of those declarations made by the church in recent centuries by, a cert, by uh, certain wings of the church in recent cent centuries. She shifts the focus to God and to the potential blessing to other people. She declares that God's mercy extends to anyone, to anyone at all who will fear him and also for all generations to come. So it's meant to be speaking to us today as well. She says God's strong arm is there always to help the helpless. Also stating the other side of that coin that he will scatter the pride and in, in, if they come before him with a sense of self-sufficiency. That's verse 51. And God puts down the mighty and, the, and, and at, the, other, at the, the same time exalts the lowly. That's verse 52. Demonstrating his uh, profound fairness and the aspect of, of gaining closeness and intimacy with God relies in a profound sense of humility before him. These verses are the things that lay the foundation for understanding Mary's perspective, not what people might say about her. Mary herself is the one who switches it and emphasizes the power, the holiness, and even the love and mercy of God. Drawing attention as well to the fact that his inclination will always, always be to those who are humble towards him, not the arrogant or the proud. 
So that's what God is seen to do here. And it's impossible not to notice that this theme is intrinsically linked to what God is doing here with Mary himself. He acts against those who are high and mighty, who view themselves in their own est estimation as being something important. In fact, Bailey saying it's these people who do not feel they need God. He humbles the haughty. He removes that type of people from their throne. In fact, it says his job is to exalt the humble and the lowly. And verse 48 reminds us, it says, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. So there we are. Mary sees herself as just a servant. You can see that she begins by describing how God has acted in her life. But she also takes that on board from a hu humility, a humble perspective, but then extends it outwards to encompass any who act in that way towards him, saying God will in fact pay attention to all the lowly, to all those in needs. In fact, he sees and cares for and uplifts, uplifts those type of people. Blessed be the poor in spirit, Jesus would say. Mary emphasized this still further, practically, in verse 53, when he says he fills the hungry with good things, but sends the rich away empty. The term rich here symbolizing again, not just physically rich, but those who feel they have a richness of self-sufficiency, their self satisfied even self-sustaining anyone in fact who does feel that they don't need god what becomes of them it tells us here she says god will send those people that type of person away empty so not merely just in the physical sense but spiritually as well meaning they will remain unsatisfied unfulfilled as they try and rely on themselves in fact they will reach a point in time scripture throughout the New Testament reveals where they will reach the end of their selves and will lead a need. And then the, op the opportunity is at that point to find out, perhaps to turn to him that they had ultimately, that they weren't able to uh, survive or flourish or even be blessed on the basis of their own resources. So in this second section of the Magnificent, God's actions can be summarized as that seen by the, as God who scatters the proud. He's the one who deposes, upends the arrogant and ultimately sends those self-sufficient people away empty handed only because they're declaring that they don't need him and can manage on their own. He hands them over, if you like, to the consequences of their own perspective. And throughout all of this, simultaneously, he is seen to exhibit his strength and fairness in exalting the humble and blessing those who are spiritually hungry. The core message here throughout this is saying that God is inclined to bless the most ordinary people, the most unlikely individuals and anyone who seeks and trusts him out with the right posture of heart just like Mary herself here. And in this final section of this passage, she responds by uh, out of her own experience, so to speak, stating that she did not do anything great, that it is God that has done the great thing for her. And she expands her perspective to pass it out, to point it out towards other, emphasizing that God can exalt them, can exalt you and I also. This highlights that most individuals, any one of us, have the potential, if we have the right attitude, the right sense of humility, the right posture of heart towards God, that we can be part of and take part in significant part of God's plans, not just for us, but for society, the place in which we live, and perhaps even the whole world. Now, for a moment, let's consider this thought. What if nobody paid any attention to you? Have you ever felt that you'd never amount to much? Have you ever felt in life that you're being criticized and discouraged or not recognized? Now, it's important to be cautious and accepting uh, in, in how you handle and deal with criticism towards you. And it's getting that balance right between having a, a humble attitude, but at the same time, accepting and understanding that what people say about you isn't necessarily that important. To illustrate this, I have just a few comments that are made by teachers, coaches, 
critics, managers, people with responsibility for some very famous, indi people, in, uh, famous individuals and what was said about these people when they were young. I think it's interesting. Socrates was called an immoral corrupter of youth. Beethoven was declared as a young child to be hopeless as a composer without potential. Fred Astaire, in, uh, in when he was to be signed for one of the movie studios, he did a casting and the comments said, can't act, can't sing, he's going bald, but granted he can dance a little. Walt Disney, earlier in his career, was told that he lacked creative ideas. Louis Pasteur, Nobel Prize winner, he finished 15th out of 22 in his chemistry class examination. Winston Churchill, he failed his sixth grade exam at school. That's what we today in the UK call the 11 plus. Everybody of my age group knows exactly what that means and, and what a profound uh, negative step that was for people of that age where they were div divided and sent in one of two directions. He failed his 11 plus. He, he, didn't, he didn't pass the, the exam that was meant to transition him from primary school, from infant school, to uh, the, the type of school that he would go to from age 11 plus, which would have a profound effect on some people's lives and the opportunities that were afforded them. TV series MASH, it's still being repeated every night here in the UK. The, the, that series was rejected 21 times by various different studios. Michael Jordan, not that big a uh, name in, in the UK, but in the US, and the listeners there will, kn will know him, famous basketball player. He was cut, I believe, I've been told, from his high school basketball team at one time. And what about Henry Ford? <laughs> Did you know that he never thought to put reverse in the first car he made, and he quickly had to retool and reset up his whole production line? Now I give these, these are worldly examples, but I give them to illustrate the fact that the most unlikely individuals can still go on to achieve great things because it's not what people say about us, what matters is what God says about it. And God will and can take pleasure in the most unlikely people. A point, a point that is beautifully encapsulated here in the story of Mary. In Mary's outburst, her selflessness, as she simply, in response to this amazing great thing that's going to happen to her, instead points outwards, points upwards to God's greatness, not only in her life, but in the life of others, and even with it pointing out on the wider perspective to the whole nation of Israel. Now, those examples came from the world, but let me consider um, for a moment in history some of God's interaction with those great names of the Old Testament, the patriarchs and beyond, such as Abraham, Moses and others. To put it mildly, they were quite an interesting and by worldly standards, one might even say a bit of a dodgy bunch. Yet through them, God displayed his mercy, his faithfulness and worked his plans for the salvation of mankind through them. It's safe to say they were undeserving indeed, unlikely candidates, many of them, for God's extraordinary grace. It is because of his mercy that God chose then and chooses, chooses today to still employ into his plan and purposes some really undeserving people. In simple terms, what I'd like to convey today is that God prefers to use unlikely individuals, even an unlikely <laughs> uh, nation, race like Israel, that falls into this category as well, he uses them to achieve his purposes for the salvation of mankind. To illustrate this point, I'd like to share a hypothetical scenario. If you were to imagine you were part of a, a community searching to select a new leader, like these people did, the primary takeaway from this illustration is that God wants to work people and he will use the most unlikely individuals to do that. So with that in mind, I'd like to just give you a sort of fictional report of a search committee who are conducting numerous interviews and reference checks on who among these Old Testament patriarchs might be a suitable leader. Okay. Let's hear what they might say, quite reasonably, about these people. Adam, 
a good man, but he has some issues with his wife. And we have accounts of him walking naked in the woods. Noah, a boat builder for many years experience, but experienced no converts during his lifetime and was prone to launch off on unrealistic building projects. Abraham exhibited some behavioural issues in relation to his wife and the sanctity of marriage. Joseph, known as a guy who has big dreams, but is also has a prison record. Moses, a sort of humble man, but a pure communicator, and in fact has a stutter, is known to tend to act rashly. And also we have, have rumors of a possible murder charge leveled against him. David, initially a promising leader, but someone of voyeuristic tendencies, even is rumored to have had an affair with a neighbor's wife. Solomon, a great teacher, but no church could accept him, no community could accept him as a leader for his penchant for numerous wives. Elijah, a man suffering from depression and even total mental breakdown under pressure. Elisha, reported as living with a single woman, a widow, not his wife, during his previous time of ministry. Hosea, a loving pastor, yes, but any congregation might struggle with his wife because of her previous occupation. Jeremiah, definitely emotionally unstable, an alarmist, constantly negative and always lamenting things. Isaiah, bit of an eccentric, claims to have seen angels uh, ha having heard and had revelations in special languages given to him. Bit of a Pentecostal, really. <laughs> Jonah, he can't have him, refused God's call to ministry previously. He, in fact, he only did it when he was compelled to, following some supposed traumatic encounter with a large fish of all things. Haggai, yeah, a very practical man, very well respected mason and carpenter, but we've identified some really hostile attitudes and issues towards rich people. I wonder if we'd do any better if we looked into the New Testament. What might we say about these? Well, John. John, he's this guy who claims to be a Baptist, but he doesn't dress well. Scruffy, uh, eccentric, lives outdoors for a month at a time and has a really weird diet. Peter, a straightforward guy, a blue collar worker, but with a really fiery temper known for confrontations, losing his temper, including a dispute with another believer, Paul in Antioch. He has elements of being a strong, dynamic leader, but he lacks any tact, and he's particularly when it comes to dealing with people younger and less experienced than him. And Timothy, well, too young. We can't even consider him. He's too young. Jesus, hmm, he's popular among the people of his time. Yet he seems to manage to offend everybody, including his own followers, causing that, them to, to grow exponentially and then dwindle down to just 12 members who eventually will even reject him. It seems his tendency is always to be moving on. Now, that's just a little bit of a lighthearted illustration, if you like, that is meant to humorously underline the idea that God often chooses people, individuals, that the world would deem unlikely or even unsuitable for any significant purpose in the plans or grand design of God. So to get back to this passage, in summary, Mary's praise in this passage is centred around God, not herself. That's the key point to take away. God saving, bless her and blessing her and using her as a person from very humble or origins, chosen from amongst the most unlikely individuals. Now, while Mary was indeed blessed by God, and we can describe her that way, and chosen by God to accomplish 
the remarkable task, the most remarkable task in human history, that of bringing the Messiah Jesus Christ into the world. It's important also not to exalt her beyond that measure. She didn't do it herself. She was, yes, she was blessed, no doubt, and she, but she, her greatness actually lay, I believe, in her humility and the fact that she recognised that she herself was a mere mortal standing before a holy God. Her attitude in this prayer underscores the principle that it is always God that should be magnified. It stands in opposition to the notice to the idea among some that she should be regarded as some sort of sinless, perfect human being, or even as the Queen of Heaven. She herself, I think, would dismiss such notions. In fact, I think she would think they were absurd, a bit embarrassing. Her response idea to those ideas and to those things I be, would believe would be exactly as we see here, one of humility, acknowledging herself as just an unworthy servant of God. Instead, she would exalt God, acknowledging that it was only in him. There was no merit in her position. It was just the simple fact that God chose her. In essence, Mary recognized her lowliness and firmly believed in God and God's grace and recognized that it was only that that exalted her and made her special in any way at all. There's not even a hint in this passage that she saw herself as superior to anyone else in any other way. Instead, she acknowledges her lowly state in this passage and she calls out and says, uh, and is thankful for God's mercy and strength in choosing to use her, the most unlikely of, of individuals in her divine purpose. Mary simply blessed the Lord, and instead of claiming any credit, she magnified the Lord for his grace and his power. That's verse 48. His holiness, verse 49. His mercy, verse 50. His provision in verse 53. And his faithfulness in verse 54. Mary praised God for blessing her, a simple, humble woman, thanking God for fulfilling his promise originally to Abraham through her. She tied it all together. Right here, the message from this word is simply to say, Mary, say, look, it's God who saves. It's he who blesses, and it is he who uses people, even unlikely people, and I'm a prime case. That's what she said about these herself, not what is claimed about her on her behalf by others. It's no secret what the God has done. And it's no secret also what he's done for Mary. He can do for others, which means he can do it for you and I also. With arms open wide, coming to him with the right same state of mind as she has, then through, through God can fulfill his purposes through you too also, my friend. And our response to this should be the same as Mary's response. When he does that, just give thanks and praise to him. He is mindful always of our situation in the world. But yet, no matter how tough it is and what people think of us, I'm telling you, friends, he can still do great things through, through you because he will extend his mercy to you if you call on him or even if you just need him. He has performed mighty deeds, not just in her life, but in our lives also. And he can lift us up and he can give us good things. And he can remember us as he remembered her in his mercy, just as he always promises throughout the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Okay, that's it for today. That's that passage over. I do hope you find that helpful. We'll return tomorrow and we'll look at the actual birth now of the first of these children to arrive, that of John the Baptist and what that means. So thank you so much for joining with me today. Can I remind you, you've been listening to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. My name is Jeremy McCandless, and you can like, subscribe, or share this podcast in any of uh, over 20 podcast platforms, 25 places, I think, in total, that it's available to be accessed through. There, 
It's hosted on the Bible Project at buzzsprout.com and it's there that you will always find active links to the other areas of the ministry, the socials, uh, places like the YouTube channel and even places like Buzzsprout itself where it's hosted and you'll find an episode notes page. In other words, not just the episode notes, but also a full transcript of everything I've said. And there's also a place there when you can begin to partner with this ministry if you feel God's calling you to do that. That way, we are able to make this podcast together. I've been able to make this podcast freely available on all these platforms and also on Buzzsprout without advertising revenue or tracking the browsing history of the people who are listening to it, which I think is really important. But with that all said and done, the main thing is keep the main thing the main thing. You're here and together we can work through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. The Word of God, studying it pretty much every day in depth, part of the rhythm of your daily lives. What a blessing that can be and we can do it together. So thank you for joining me and I'll see you back here again tomorrow, I trust, from the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Bye-bye now.